everyone. Welcome back to the Teach Middle East podcast, or welcome if this is your first time listening. My name is Lisa Grace, and it is my pleasure to have you listening to us today. On our podcast today, we have Dr. Saima Rana. She is the CEO and principal of Gems World Academy Dubai. But not only that, she's also the deputy CEO of Gems Education Global. Now, she is a formidable woman and a leader in the space. So we are excited to have her on the podcast. Welcome, Dr. Saima. Thank you so much, Lisa. It is my absolute pleasure to join you. I've been very excited about meeting with you and speaking to you this afternoon. Thank you. You are most welcome. I want to start straight in because I want to ask the questions everyone wonders but never have the opportunity to ask. Take me back to Little Saima. Where did you grow up? What was life like for Little Saima? Oh, wow, you are taking me back. Um, so I grew up in London. I am born and bred in London, in West London. So I was born in Hillingdon um, and I've lived in the borough of Ealing all my life. Um, so I grew up in a beautiful, loving, caring family uh, with three siblings. So there were four of us growing up. I have an elder sister and two younger brothers and very hardworking, humble, uh, amazing um, role model parents. Um, mother was a, a teacher and then a housewife and father, a businessman, worked incredibly hard to give us a great life, a great childhood. Um, and we were a family that was very religious in terms of our morals and our values, a Muslim family, uh, background from India, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and England. Um, but a family that was very much aware of our community and about people and relationships. And my parents were incredibly caring people. If people around them in the sort of um, late 80s didn't have much you know my parents were the first to be approached and to support so grow up grew up in a very loving family we used to laugh to our parents that we had an open door policy my mother used to say an open door policy anybody can arrive to our to our home and share our meal what little or lot we had um we never sort of fussed about um food or things it was there for everybody it wasn't just for us siblings so we grew up with this mentality of sharing and caring and many a nights many a nights me and my siblings spent um, sleeping on the floor in our family home because visitors arrived without notice and needed a bed and of course in in our family and in our culture the visitors would get the bed and get the best of what we had and we'd end up sleeping on the floor together but it was such a joyous happy um you know a real sort of a life full of experiences and full of laughter and love brilliant and what was school like for you where did you go to school so I went to school in the borough of Ealing. Um, I went to state school and I'm very proud that I am a student of state school and the state education system in the United Kingdom. Um, I went to a state grammar school for um, secondary. Um, you know, school was just a, a phenomenal place for me. I loved and still do love people, love friends, uh, very much enjoyed learning. Um, I, I could be mis mischievous um, at school, not to say that um, I wasn't your sort of, um, oh gosh, I hope my students don't hear this, but I wasn't your sort of perfect, um, you know, A-star student. I was the mischievous, um, always wanting to inquire and be inquisitive um, student with lots of friends, but always high performing. So I was your A-star student because academics were important to me and I came from a family where they were important, but I did enjoy my experience. And this is something that's really important to me for my children here is that you must enjoy the experience of school because they're your best years. You learn how to make friends, you learn how to have um, a heartbreak, you learn how to fall out of friendships and then have to deal with them, have to be part of a sporting elite team or be part of athletics and, you know, just enjoy the experiences. Of course, success and academics and outcomes are incredibly important, but they're not more important than the experiences of being young, being carefree, enjoying company, understanding who you want to be when you're older. Perhaps you um, end up making friends with the types of people that uh, will, will carry you through your school years and sometimes you won't. So th those things were very important for me personally at school. My teachers were very important to me at school. I loved my teachers. Um, they gave me a lot of time 
in particular, my um, I spent a lot of time in the um, in the gym and, and with the sports teachers. I was hockey captain. I was netball captain. I was a cross country runner. I was 200 and 100 meter runner. I was very much into sports. I loved it. It just I loved being um, competitive. I loved. Uh, winning statistically on data and performance, but I also love being part of a team and being hockey captain, netball captain gave me that sort of um, place within my uh, my school peers that I was leading a team, but uh, but it was very much a collegiate, uh, you know, a, a sport that was about caring and looking after other people. I loved the expressive arts. I loved singing and dancing. I loved art and I really wanted to study art at university, but my parents felt that that wasn't something that would helped me get into um, a, a career um, uh, with a paid job when I left university. And they would say, well, well you know, you, 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 you know, follow those sporting and expressive art dreams and passions of yours as, as a hobby, if you like. Um, and that's unfortunately that that was something that I had to um, accept. And I went on to study um, uh, economics, business, mathematics, which I loved as well. I absolutely loved those subjects. Um, and so I went off to study at Nottingham University um, and just thoroughly enjoyed my time. For me, it was um, leaving London was a big deal for me. Um, you know, going to Nottingham, it was something that um, for me, it was like leaving the country at that time. I, I was a part of a very loving family, immediate family, but also an extended family of about 140, 150 relatives. So going off to Nottingham on my own, it was incredibly, um, culturally, it was very different. And I found it challenging in the first couple of days. I wasn't used to Nottingham. And I remember, and I remember so vividly looking at the pavement at one point and thinking, this is so different from the pavement in London. And I don't know why, but that was something that really sort of struck me that I'm in a different place. Um, but I thoroughly enjoyed my time at Nottingham, made so many friends and um, got to know so many people from different walks of life. And I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. I loved education so much that I continued with education when I came back to London after university. And 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 just the thought of, of being in an office and, and being an office worker wasn't something I wanted to do. And at that time, I was getting some great offers from consultancy companies, uh, London Stock Exchange. But it was just something I didn't want to do. I wanted to do something different. And um, it was just extraordinary. I ended up in um, my teacher training program at Roehampton and the most amazing, amazing uh, dean in Marilyn Holness and phenomenal lady, you know, um, a huge, for me, a role model, an, an enormous personality, female uh, role model for me. And just ended up uh, working um, and working really hard in schools and just fed in love. The first, And I'll never forget that first lesson I took. I walked in and I just fed in love with teaching, with children, with the classroom environment. And I never looked back throughout my years of studying or working in schools. I've absolutely loved being in school. So where did you teach? So I taught in an interesting constituency in West London called Hounslow. And at that time, when I started my teaching practice, um, I taught in Hounslow and Brentford. And Brentford School for Girls was incredibly um, different from Hounslow Manor, where we had a huge, uh, in Hounslow Manor, we had a huge uh, white working class uh, and Gypsy Roma traveler community at that time. And it was just an eye opener. Culturally, I lived in Ealing all my life in West London, but it was a completely different um, community that we were serving. A really tough, really tough community, but it was extraordinary. And I made some great, great um, progress with the students and the children that I was teaching then. I'm still in touch with them, would you believe it? And, um, you know, they have their own businesses now and, and they have their own sort of careers, which is amazing. And I'm very proud of them. Um, and, and I taught in Brentford, uh, school, which is a school for girls, amazing school, really very, very different, very preppy, actually, very, very lovely, but both state schools. I then went on um, to take a full time role at Hounslow Manor. I was a classroom teacher within the sort of first year I became head of department. I've always loved working, Lisa. I've always loved um, proving more to myself than anyone else. I can make a difference. I've always been about change and impact. And sometimes it can be misconstrued, I think, in terms of being competitive or really ambitious and ruthlessly ambitious. But it's not really about that. My motivation is genuinely to make change and impact and uh, make better things that I, I, I can see that perhaps are in my control. So very quickly promoted to head of department of the uh, business, economics, mathematics department. Enjoyed myself for about six years there. Left that school as a senior leader and 
that inquisitive part of me never left me as a, I had it as a child and as a grown up, as, a, as a, a young adult, it still remained with me. And I just couldn't understand um, the state sector, the, the sort of uh, private sector and how the education piece works in the UK with the government and the funding and why some schools get more money than others. And, and I just wanted to understand that better. So what better to go and work for the local government? Um, so I took on a post with Cambridge Education, Mott MacDonald, who was working for the Department for Education under the Labour government for building schools for the future. And I worked there for six years as a lead um, consultant for education, technology and infrastructure. And boy, did I enjoy myself. It was just such an amazing experience and opportunity to help re build, reconstruct um, and redesign Victorian buildings as well as new buildings in the sort of um, area of um, King's Cross, Islington, um, um, all the way up to sort of um, Holloway and, and, and just including all that area where we had about 40 schools. And it was just such an extraordinary experience to develop. I learned about design, I learned about architecture, school architecture, I learned about um, community um, needs and aspirations and how building and design and colors can make aspirations come to life. It was just an extraordinary time. And I enjoyed that for about six years. I then went on to take on a post at a school called Westminster Academy, which is based in the fifth most deprived constituency in England, but surrounded by the most expensive areas uh, um, of England. So it was a school that was in special measures. It was a very challenging uh, time for the school, incredibly difficult. Um, so I joined that school as a senior leader to support the head teacher for two years. I said I would come in and help us uh, turn the school around. It was a team of us, four of us were going to go to turn the school around. And we did within the first sort of 12 to 18 months, it became outstanding. And we were very, very happy. We were over the moon with what we were able to do. It was a lot of hard work, Lisa. We were literally, I remember I was literally on my knees doing this work. You know, it was long hours. And it, was, it wasn't just about hard work in terms of um, having to sort of, make things happen. It was about actually inspiring uh, communities in, in changing the culture. And as you know, cultural change is incredibly difficult. You can modify buildings, you can modify schemes of work and so on. But to make people genuinely believe that this can be done, it is possible. There's no miracle here. We've just got to really believe and get on with the job and work hard and practice practice, 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 so your performance is outstanding. We did that with the children. And the children were from two very, very high profile um, estates. Um, you know, there was gang warfare, there was drugs, there was violence, there, there was knife crime. And to be working in that kind of melting pot with um, children from refugee communities as well, who were, so it was a real melting pot, but it was extraordinary. It was an extraordinary school, an extraordinary community, and it still is, sponsored by the Dan Gore family. And their sort of genealogy was very much as refugees into the United Kingdom as well. So that whole sort of um, connection of the heritage of why this school was sponsored by the Dangor family, who were Jewish refugees from Baghdad many, many years ago and wanted to give back, who had become incredibly successful in the United Kingdom, wanted to give back to a community that they lived in um, through the means of a single sponsored academy, the Westminster Academy. It was just extraordinary. And it was like, I have such fond memories of that time, you know, and after the two years, I was asked to become associate principal. And then after that, I think it took another year and I was asked to become principal of that school. And it was my most, um, I just felt so blessed. You know, the children there were phenomenal. They came from such difficult backgrounds and, you know, they were my role models. They inspired me. They challenged me. They, um, yeah, they just made me want to do they made me want to do better for the school, but they also made me want to do a lot more good for the world. I mean, they were just extraordinary children. So how did you turn? I know you had a team with you, but how did you turn that school around in 18 months? And the reason I ask is I worked in challenging schools in Enfield, in Haringey, um, in Waltham, Stowe. That type of turnaround is remarkable. How did you guys do it? What did you do? So the first thing, I mean, that's fascinating, Lisa, and congratulations, because those areas I know are incredibly challenging and incredibly great areas, great people, incredibly challenging um, context. It was about the simple things like the process, the people, 
um, and, and just making sure the performance uh, was being accounted for and, and was monitored, regularly monitored. So in terms of the processes, we made sure that the schemes of work, the uh, curriculum planning was done to a level that in which allowed children to actually be able to progress every lesson rather than every term or every year. You could see the progress that children were making. Any one lesson, I remember in one of my first meetings with the staff, um, I made it very clear and, and, and people would know this and I'm not saying they weren't necessarily doing this, but it was about saying that in every lesson, every child, regardless of starting point, must make progress. Otherwise, what is the value of them coming to school? We had a huge attendance problem and, and that was because children were coming to school and possibly thinking, well, what's the point? I, I'm not really gaining anything. I'm not meeting the, the sort of requirements that I should be. So that was really important that not only do the children make progress, but they feel they're making progress. They understand they're making progress. So it was almost like pulling in, putting in a, a sense of success for each child in every moment they spent at Westminster Academy. Parent, the parent community who themselves were at that time, it's probably no, no longer the case, but at that time were illiterate refugees themselves struggling with um, home contacts and just settling in, um, making sure that they were on board by making sure they understood what was required and why the children needed to be at school. You know, Lisa, this will not be unfamiliar to you, I'm sure, because of the context you've worked at. We would go to the children's homes if they didn't turn up to school, knock on the door, you need to be in school. Come on, let's go to school and have like um, a school bus with us or, um, a, you know, an Uber, etc. We would do that. We would do that because it was important that children understood that we cared. And I think that was the most important thing. I remember Sir Professor Brighouse, who was a mentor of mine, God bless him. Um, he would say to me that, you know, Simon, the biggest thing you can do is you can give children hope. And where does hope come from? Hope comes from your environment. Hope comes from the people that are around you. Hope comes from believing in children, believing in people. Hope comes from feeling confident, feeling secure in where you are. And so that was a mantra I would always use with everybody. You know, give the children the hope. Understand that these children, to give them a great education would mean that you would change the lives of many generations to come in that family. And it, I say this as a voice because I have this platform today. Thank you very much, Lisa. But there are so many people like me, like yourself, who have contributed to society and the global platform through being amazing teachers and head teachers and senior leaders in these areas, in these challenging areas. And the biggest thing we've been able to do, I think, more so than the academic success. I mean, we were in the top 10 schools in, in the United Kingdom with our outcomes and our uh, performance measures in terms of value add, but we can give them hope and we can, we can allow them to see that there's a huge world out there and there is a space for you and a place for you in that world. You've just got to own it. You've got to look inside yourself and believe that there is a space for you and go and own it. And that was one of the things we did with the children. And as soon as we had the children on site, as soon as the children wanted to be able to make a difference for themselves. Our attendance figures went on up. And of course, if you're attending, you're in school. If you're in school and you're learning and you're progressing, automatically your results will start to go up. And we were fortunate at that time. You know, it was very mechanical as well. Um, we needed to get them the, the basics, English and maths and science, et cetera. And we were able to dissect um, the curricula and the criterion to be able to achieve passes and, and good passes and strong cut passes. And it, why we needed to be mechanical in those first couple of uh, months was because we needed to show the children, hope is great and that's what we need, but we also needed to show them that they could achieve. And once we we got those results in that first year, which was extraordinary, and I remember that night I, I was in charge of um, the curriculum assessment and data, so I would download all the results and check what's happening at midnight and then have to call my principal and say, we did it. And I remember that night before I downloaded the results, I prayed. And I prayed for the cohort and said, please, God, you know, you know, make sure they're successful because it's really important, not for them. It was important for the community and the school. We needed to show the community and the school, if you work hard and you turn up, you will get the outcomes. And once that happened, it was just literally contagious. We couldn't stop it because we had we had proved that we could do it. This school, this community, after so many years, can do it. And suddenly it just went on and it was just contagious. And we were we were never not successful after that. Brilliant. I actually like the fact that you had to go back to basics because sometimes it's good to say, oh, we checked all the things and we did all the, the, the higher level things. But just going back to basics and being very mechanical, being 
traditional nowadays is what they call it making sure you get that math in you get that english in you make sure that the students have that basic grounding before you add all the flowery bits on top so i loved that how did you then move from that school to dubai and to gems how did that transition take place so that's really interesting when i was in london i was a governor of some private schools as well and um, the reason why I wanted to be a, a governor of private schools was because I wanted to see what, what it was that they were doing and what could what could I do better for my school. Um, so I've always been involved in charity, Lisa. My mother was a, um, a very charitable person and all, my father is also, but my mother acted more so on the charitable endeavors. And so I am a founder and a trustee of the Shehnaz Foundation, which is a charity named after my mother, Shehnaz. And, um, unfortunately she passed away so the charity very much does a lot of good work in her name and um we build schools we have three aims in in our charitable endeavor the first aim is looking after children who don't have access to education across the globe in particular girls education i'm very very keen on that and we have schools across the globe predominantly in india pakistan sudan etc boys can attend as well but it's predominantly for girls education Second aim is uh, women's empowerment, incredibly important to look after the women in, in, in the world. I think especially those that are uh, in some way or shape uh, victims of uh, violence, domestic violence, uh, mental health issues, refugee mothers. Um, so we very much support women um, who need a bit of support in terms of their own mental health, but also um, employability, skill sets, etc. And our third aim, I am religious, I'm Muslim. We build mosques and synagogues and churches and mandirs and gurdwaras where there aren't any, so that um, there's a place for worship for everybody where we can reach. Um, but also we help prepare people that have uh, passed away and if their families don't have any money to cremate or bury, we support them with that. So those are our three aims. Now, I had heard of Mr. Sunny Varki. Of course, I'd heard of Gems, but I had heard of Mr. Sunny Varki with the Varki Foundation and the great work that his philanthropic arm um, takes um, takes a huge involvement and, and focus on in terms of um, societal deprivation and support for education in particular. And so when we met, we, we talked a lot about charity, et cetera. And he had said to me, look, come and work for Gems Education in Dubai. Um, it's close to the, the countries that you support. So I go out to these countries myself and set up the schools for my charity. And I do like to support my charities um, through my own income. Um, and in England, um, I was getting a, a great income, as you would as a head teacher in London. But of course, you know, Dubai would be able to afford me a better income uh, tax free, which would be able to support my charities even more. So uh, where I was able to build a few schools in London, I can build uh, many more being employed in a place like Dubai. That's not to say that I don't... Um, enjoy what I do and I don't you know I absolutely love GEMS education I'm very proud to be a member of GEMS education I understand you know all the work that we do and our philanthropic arm but it was genuinely um, that was what really interested me about Dubai being able to help um, my charity and then when GEMS were and but I was still thinking about it but when GEMS World Academy came up as a proposition I just couldn't say no it was a school that was a flagship school in terms of the international baccalaureate was it doing as well as it could have been at that time? Possibly no. COVID was coming in. What a challenge. What an extraordinary opportunity uh, to run, uh, to lead the flagship school for the GEMS education portfolio. I just couldn't say no. So um, here I am. Yeah. And GEMS World, talk to me about it. What kind of a school is it? Oh, wow. So GEMS World Academy, it is a dream school. Honestly, it has... It's an international baccalaureate school. We are an all-through school. We offer the we have a nursery, which is delightful. Um, we have a PYP program, an MYP program, a, a career-related program, and a diploma program. So we have all three four programs in the school. We are a world school. Um, you know, we are a school with over 120 different nationalities, and each nationality is a minority, and you won't find that in most schools. In most schools, you have a predominant nationality group, but you do have over 100 nationalities. It's the nature of the UAE, I believe, in particular in Dubai. Um, but our school, every nationality is a minority. So you can imagine 120 nationalities with all nationalities, 4%, 5%, and that's it, sort of maybe 6% where there is conflict, but uh, where children have come in from conflict areas. 
but it's really like a mini United Nation. Everybody is different here. And that just makes for such an amazing place because, you know, nobody feels left out because everybody is different. And so you see uniqueness in all of our children. Our children are kind and humble. Um, they're so inquisitive. Um, they want to challenge everything, which is a true Ivy learner, I believe. Um, they're global citizens in that they want to change the world. They want to do better for the world. And they're incredibly academic as well. So it's it's a place where, where there is something for everybody. And, and the nicest thing about Gems World Academy is that we are an inclusive school. So we do not select. Um, if we have spaces and you want to come to our school, you are most welcome and we will look after you. And as a result, we have a real um, comprehensive intake, if you like. And our children are so kind to each other, whether you are gifted and talented, special educational needs, EAL, um, special, you know, gift, uh, any behavioral problems, you're all included in our community. It's just so delightful. And you see it, you see it at, at um, lunchtime, you see it at break time, you see it when somebody's not doing quite so well in their trials after school, you just see the way in which children behave and their attitude. It's just extraordinary. And for me, it's one of um, the best places on the planet. I love being at Gems World Academy. I love being in my office. I have windows in my office where all the children can see me and I can see them. And no matter what's happening in the world, and a lot is happening, as, as you know, in the world today, which is not great, um, but the children just really lift your spirits and they make you realize that tomorrow is going to be a better day, regardless of what's happening today. So it's an exquisite place. Our teachers are second to none. You know, they are passionate, they are caring, they know their children, they care about the children's progress. One of the things that we promise our parents when they join Gems World Academy or when they return to Gems World Academy after the summer break is that we will always keep your children safe, secure and successful. And the safety is all about ensuring that there is no sort of nasty behavior. Children will be mischievous and it's their right to be, they're of that age and they must be actually. Um, but not being sort of racist or discriminatory or, or horrible to someone. So you hurt their heart and you hurt their feelings. That is something we don't accept. So safety is all about that. We promise that they'll be secure and secure is all about confidence. You know, I want my children to be confident. I want them to walk into the school and say to me, Dr. Rana, I didn't enjoy this lesson yesterday. Or Dr. Rana, I think that sports field should be a different color. Or I think you should, we, we should have a different menu for lunch. They need to have that confidence because every single child matters their needs, their wants, their desires, their aspirations and their hopes, they all matter. Their fears matter too, because fear is a good thing. It's not a bad thing, but we want our children to express their fears so we can help them navigate and learn how to uh, combat these fears. And then success is very important. For me, you know, the more successful you are in terms of academics, the more doors will open for you. So it's not uh, it's not the end sort of goal to be successful. It's just a, a medium or a method to have lots of options and opportunities. So I always say to children, you've got to be successful too, but you can only be successful if you are safe and secure. Because without that, as you know, as adults, if you're not feeling safe, if you're not feeling yeah. secure in the workplace or at home, you're very like unlikely to be successful. Yeah. If I, because I do quite a lot of school tours, I go around, I look at different schools. If I come into Gems World Academy, what am I likely to see? Well, you're likely to you're likely to see a lot. What you're likely to feel is that you don't want to leave. Um, but what you're likely to see, and I would I would absolutely love to be delighted to host a visit for you, Lisa, whenever you're ready. Um, what you will see is you will see this. Um, bustling sort of uh, community where there's just so many people everywhere and they're people of different shapes and sizes talking about different things and the children are cackling and um, they're in groups and they're either hugging or singing happy birthday to somebody or they're wanting to find out where they can go for homework club or they're wanting to uh, speed off to their athletics uh, practice they're talking to their teachers, they're talking to parents, they're talking to the support staff. You'll see everybody in a community that is here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to make sure that our children feel safe, secure and successful. And you'll see everybody doing that, whether it's a security guard at the gate, whether it's myself standing at the door welcoming children in at the start of the day or bidding them farewell at the end of the day. You will see a genuine, it's, it's like a... Um, 
it's it's like a it's 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 a bustling community. There's lots of people and lots of things going on, and you know there's over sort of at any one point at the start of the day or the end of the day, we have over three thousand five hundred children approximately and parents and staff going somewhere doing something. It's very busy. It's very busy, but it's very happy. I like that. I got that nice picture. I love I love a humming school. When you go and you yeah. hear that hum, it's a happy hum of busy people, busy students doing and being the best they can be in that in that space. I love that. Absolutely. And Lisa, you know, one thing I've never liked is silent corridors. Mm. You know, I used to be in the UK. I've been an inspector and you know, we would have, you would see these things like there's a line on in the corridor and you've got to stay on your right or you've got to stay on your left and you've got to be absolutely quiet, silently walking to your next lesson. I can't think of something, anything worse. It's dreadful. You know, the cackle of children laughing and telling someone what they did and, and just enjoying themselves in the corridors. I just love it. That, that, like you said, that humming, that buzz, that noise of children. And if, if I can't hear it, I think something's wrong. Something's, got, something's not quite right. And I want to hear that noise. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I want to turn the podcast a little bit because based on the first half, you are extremely busy and very yeah. driven and very focused. But that's that can't be all there is to you, Dr. Sama. You have to have got a side to you that is a little bit more chilled, a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more you. What do you do when you're not sitting at that desk, when you're not in school, when you don't have to be on? What do you do to chill out? Interesting. So I swim, I walk. I love music, Lisa. I love all types of music, you name it. And I just I just love it. I love to dance. I really love dancing. So, you know, whether it's um R&B hip hop uh, whether it's a classical music a bit of um um you, you know um soca uh, bangra bollywood you name it i just love music and i love to dance i don't know if um others around me would say that it's a good thing that i dance but in my head i'm a great dancer i absolutely love it um and most of the time you'll find me even at home if i'm getting early in the morning i'll be sort of dancing around i always have music on whether i'm working whether i'm getting uh, ready for work uh, in the car i always have music on it really relaxes me love swimming love running love walking love uh, biking uh, I'm not a gym person. I wouldn't go to the extent to say that I um, I don't like the word hate, but um, and I never use it. But um, with the gym, I could use that word. I just can't be in a closed space doing something. I, I just don't. I don't get that. But um, it's not for me. I do. I do. One of the things I absolutely love is being around friends. Um, I have some really good friends. When I came to Dubai, I didn't know anybody in Dubai. And um, I've made um, some uh, some good friends, uh, at least five really, really good friends who I really enjoy spending time with, having lunch, having dinner. I love food. Um, I love to cook, but more so I love to eat. Um, and again, all types of food. I am a vegetarian, but I do love all types of food. Um, a really big fan of Asian food. And um, I just, yeah, I enjoy, that's how I relax. Um, but, you know, it's taken me a long time to actually accept that, well, not accept, I suppose more so to say out loud that I love working and I love working 24 seven. I never stop working. And before, when I was younger, I used to feel a little sort of embarrassed about it. Like it wasn't a good thing. So sometimes Lisa, I would say to people, if I was working, they'd say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just relaxing. But I wouldn't let them know I was working because I used to feel like they mustn't think I'm working because it just doesn't look good. But now I'm of an age, it's just like, I love it. I just love working. Um, so that is something that I enjoy doing. I always find something to do, you know, even if it's all done, there's always something to do. Let the record show that Dr. Sama likes soca. Who are you listening to? Because I'm like, that one threw me. <laughs> Listen, you know, um, I love soca because I've spent a lot of my younger years in um, visiting lots of different um, different areas of the world. And I've got some very, very good friends in um, Antigua and Trinidad. And um, yes, I know, Lisa, I've got some very good DJ friends in Tristan and uh, Tobago. And I, I know, I don't know if this is the right forum to this be- This is the um, forum. <laughs> to be, to be sharing this. Too. Don't, don't worry. Um, no, but you do, you like, um, you like 
So could you, did you just say? Yes, I do. I am Caribbean. I love soca and reggae music. It let the record show. Well, well, I I love um I love um reggae music. I love Bob Marley is a great you know um somebody in terms of his whole history. And I learned a lot about, for example, Bob Marley in my younger years when I used to go to an, the Antigua Carnival. Um, and in terms of um you know, I I don't know. It's it's um music. I think yeah, music is just for me. It's a way of my. It's it's about my well being with music. You know, I just think um. Yeah, I just love music and I love the history behind music. I love Dolly Parton. I love Kez. I love uh, Bob Dylan. I love Bob Marley. I love, um, you know, I just, I just, yeah, I just love music. And now I really do believe you love soccer because you know Kes and the band. So I know you know soccer. All right. Awesome. So in terms of travel, because you talk about your charities and I'm very fascinated by that. We might need to talk about that offline. Um, when it comes to travel, where have you been that's really been so special that you'd love to keep going? So my roots are really interesting. I, uh, my father was born in India, I moved to Pakistan when the partition happened. He was a day old or very young and he spent all, most of his life, um, a majority of his life in, in the United Kingdom, mother from Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, so I, I really enjoy going to Pakistan, I have to admit. Um, but when I say Pakistan, I mean the very challenging areas of Pakistan where there's a lot of deprivation and where I can make a difference. You know, Lisa, it's really interesting. Sometimes you can imagine in this role um, and, and, through, and through the sort of um, experiences I will have had through my life and, or not, you may not be able to imagine, but um, challenges and difficulties are something that I'm used to. And when I started at Gems World Academy, it was a turnaround project. And when I started it, I had a very tough first year. Uh, maybe a tough year and a half at Gems World Academy uh, in transitioning, not not personally, professionally. And it was, COVID was strife and I had come into a school where there was a certain context and a certain expectation. And I was coming from a different context and expectation. And of course, I understood that this needed to marry well together and I needed to appreciate this was different. Um, and I was coming from a very highly successful um, career myself in the United Kingdom and Europe you know I was I sat on the heads IB forum for nearly seven years and I I, I was doing things and I, and I worked incredibly hard for these things so it wasn't like it was just, it just landed in my lap I had worked incredibly hard so I had a career I had a reputation and I came here with big hopes and dreams about how I could support GEMS education through GEMS World Academy and my charities um, and it was a tough start it was an incredibly tough start and I remember people used to say to me how, how are you coping? This is really quite something, you know, there were some some really quite um, awful moments actually. And I'd never experienced anything like that in my, in my entire career or in my ent entire life. And I, I remember saying to them that I have visited parts of Pakistan um, through my charity work, where when I see what some children, the age of sort of three are going through, um, no clothes, no shoes, no family, no food, and just left to their own devices in this big wide world. What is it? What is it when somebody perhaps isn't appreciating the hard work I'm putting in and can't see it? I can I can handle that. And I think those things taught me so much. So those places taught me a lot. Those places taught me how to sort of um, manage my own expectations and sometimes my own um, wants, needs, and desires. And it just made me a stronger person. And that was it, early sort of adulthood that I, I learned those lessons. And they've stayed with me for a very long time. So my favorite place I would say to visit at the moment is definitely Pakistan. I love going there and meeting people and, and helping to impact communities um, and learning myself from them. Yeah, you see, it's that I love that because someone would have probably said Maldives or somewhere, but you, you, you took somewhere that actually teaches you that what you're doing makes a difference and that, you know, it's it's not always about the glitz and the glam. So I really like that. Um, in terms of the charity work that you do, is it that you go alongside governmental organizations already in place in those countries or do you go in and try to set up all new infrastructure? How does it work? I'm very fascinated by that, by the way. 
Thank you so much. And I really appreciate your fascination because it's important, you know, to know that any one person can make a difference in the world and you don't need to have a huge corporation backing you when you're doing these things. You know, um, some models that we use are NGO partnerships with NGOs. Some partnerships that we have are with the government. But predominantly what I like to do is it's it's a model that incorporates all three verticals of the charity, if you like. So we find a place in, um, in a country that really needs a school uh, or an orphanage. And we then purchase the land or we rent the land or we, the land is donated to us, depending on who owns the land. And if we purchase the land, we we uh, purchase in, in the name of God, because you can do that. There's a legal sort of uh, a methodology to do that in Pakistan in particular. Um, and then we build a school on that land. Um, and then we ensure that the gov governance of that school is held in the hands of some really amazing women who feel that actually all their job is to be a housewife and they don't really want to be out and about in the community. And perhaps they need a bit of help sort of being part of the community. So we bring them on and we train them. So I very much govern the whole thing and do all the accounts and look after the entire project. Yes, for the first six months is a model that I've tried and tested. And, you know, I do have to mention KPMG in the UK who helped me set this model up. And David Dangle, my uh, previous sponsor at the Excel Arts Foundation, who absolutely was wonderful in setting up the charity and showing me how to sort of put these models together. And um, so we would um, we would set this the, the school up. We would we would do all the recruitment. I've done. I do the teacher training. I uh, I uh, employ the members of staff. And now we're not talking about thousands of members of staff. We're talking about maybe twenty members of staff per school. And we would get the governance set up in in the form of the local community, in particular women, um, and just monitor them very closely for the first six months to a year. And once we know they're okay, we let we let it go. But the finances I look after. Um, so that's how we run the schools. Where there are straightforward partnerships with NGOs, we just give them the donation. They put a bid in and we will we will support their schools. So, for example, we've got this amazing, amazing project in Karanal, uh, under the name of Karanalia in Chennai in India. And this is a project for school uh, street children of school age, predominantly girls, but there are some boys as well. And I think there are about 580 street children approximately who are being educated through the arts and football sport, um, hygiene as well, looking after yourself, being clean, et cetera, because of disease and uh, food and nutrition, et cetera. All of those things um, are taught through sport, uh, expressive arts, uh, fashion, et cetera, including very basic English and math literacy and numeracy. And what we see in the reports from a project like that is the ramification of this project is having a ripple effect on the people at home. So the elder brothers and sisters, the mm -hmm. mums and dads, they're learning how to brush their teeth properly. They're learning how to be you know, clean and, and hyg hygienic. And these are really important things for our communities, especially street communities. So through that project, it's one project, it impacts about 3000 people in the streets of India, which is amazing. Um, so that's another model. And then we have models where we partner with some very, um, very well-to-do families who will support with the school and fund the school and help sort of manage the school with me. But ultimately, I look after all the governance in terms of the finances and the human resources. You are blowing my mind, Saima. You are literally blowing my mind. I do not know Stop how it. you do all of that. Talk to, so so you're, you're leading GEMS World Academy and then you've currently been promoted to Deputy CEO of GEMS Education Global. What, what are you excited about for that new role? Uh, I'm, I'm excited about the, the entire role itself. You know, it's, um, so I used to be Chief Education Officer, as you know, at GEMS Education Global. And um, so I, I looked after that role for two years with a phenomenal um, group of senior vice presidents at and many of you who you've had on your podcast, Lisa, um, uh, looked after the education strategy for two years. And it's the final year of the strategy now. And the senior vice presidents will implement that with our new chief education officer. So I've been promoted recently as deputy CEO. And for that, it's the strategic elements, which I've been incredibly proud to be a part of previously over the last two years. But um, it's just the 
uh, additional responsibilities of operational management, the financial oversight of the entire business plan. And we've just gone into a new um, investment with Brookfield. And so it's exciting times for us here at GEMS Education, looking after the business growth and development. That's the thing I'm most interested in because I was always involved in the financial oversight and the operational oversight and also the strategic leadership and planning. But it's actually the growth um, the business growth and development piece that excites me, going to new markets, um, growing our portfolio, looking at the new models of schools that we could have, what they look like, the new clientele that we could um, serve. These things are really interesting and exciting for me. I'm very, very excited about working um, with the founder, Mr. Sunny Varki, and with the CEO, Mr. Dino Varki, and my peer, um, Jay Varki, who's also deputy CEO, in, in entering new markets. Um, looking at new products, new types of schools that we could bring into the UAE and uh, and and across this region. Those are the things that really excite me. I am I'm looking forward to following the you know the work that you will do in this role. Um, I know you're going to be joined by another fantastic female out of the United Kingdom. I don't think I'm allowed to say her name just yet. But just, let's just put it that we share the same name. Um, and I'm excited to see what she will bring to GEMS as well. I've, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about women in leadership. Um, and, and that's something I'm very passionate about. Unfortunately, you won't be able to join us at the Women in Leadership Summit on the 28th of September. But while I have you on the podcast, talk to me about what you think are some of the barriers that are stopping women from ascending to the heights that maybe you have and even further? Yeah, I mean, what a what a great topic. You know, I think, um, look, women in educational leadership face huge, significant challenges. That, And it's not just about um, societal issues or gender inequality there's some hugely compromising um, experiences that women in leadership, in particular in education face. And I, I have had some experiences of those compromising um, challenges and barriers. When you look at education, we're vastly underrepresented, women, that is. You look at the teaching profession, women are all over the teaching profession. But when you look at the actual sort of executive roles, um, you don't see as many women as you would. I, I think, I don't know, but I think the statistics in, in terms of international leaders, I I'm, you know, would have to check this, is around 28 to 30%, maybe 32%, 28 to 32, I, I don't know. But that's, that's not good. You know, those numbers point to a glaring disparity between men and women, in particular when the, um, when, when the work of schools is very much uh, done by women in terms of teaching fraternity. So when you look at the highest levels of leadership in education, you don't see a balanced number of uh, female leaders there. Now, there are a number of reasons for that. There are obstacles that we ourselves sometimes place in front of ourselves. There are so many female leaders that are phenomenal and they, they don't want to put themselves into that position for a number of reasons, mainly um, because they feel they can't do it. But, um, you know, some, when I speak to female leaders that come to me with uh, wanting advice or guidance about the next move or whether they should step into leadership, I say, absolutely, you should. Absolutely. I mean, women are the best leaders. I'm sorry, but, you know, we just are the best leaders. I mean, we're just the best people, but we are the best leaders. And I think women sometimes undermine themselves. I think there is also the emotional aspect of, you know, having this connection to home and to family and, and their sort of role. And I don't think many people say that. And I think we need to publicly accept that this is sometimes a very heavy uh, responsibility that women carry with themselves. I have heard many, many colleagues talk about um, neglecting home or not being with, uh, with their children when they need to. Very rarely do I hear my male counterparts or my male colleagues speak such um, phrases and, and such sentences. So I think it's, it's, it's these things as well. I think women are also frequently per perceived as too emotional. And I've heard this, I've heard in, in, in meetings where people are talking, you know, a, a, a male member of the team does or says something, it's very much, um, it's assertive and they know what they're doing and they, they, they've got the experience, they know exactly what needs to happen here. But a female does it and she's too emotional, or, um, you know, she just doesn't get it. Or, um, and I've heard, I've heard it said about women, and I've heard it said about myself. 
And these sorts of things, you know, we need the male counterparts, our male counterparts to support and step up as much as our female counterparts. And I think sometimes biases in um, the workplace create environments whereby it's very difficult to navigate um, the obstacles because you don't always have to remove the obstacles, I believe. Sometimes you just need to learn how to navigate those obstacles. And I think sometimes the environment doesn't allow you to be able to do such things. Um, you know, sometimes, and I have to be careful how I say this, sometimes the complexity is such that female leaders become obstacles for other female leaders. And that makes me very sad when I see that, because it's not as simple as saying we should be supporting each other and we should be, we should be genuinely excited and proud of our female leaders and our female counterparts. And we should be not just supporting them, but we should be absolutely championing them. And I think sometimes, and I've, I, again, I've experienced this, not personally, but I've seen this happen, when women unfortunately become those obstacles for other women. And I think we have to really reflect on that and stop doing it. We have to support each other. And this is not a gender um, you know, uh, fight or anything like that. It's men against women or anything like that. But it's more about that there is a societal issue here. There is, and it is complex. It's not straightforward because within you know, the, the female sort of um, proposition, you also have culture, then you have religion, then you might have class and you might have race and you might have, there's a lot of things at play here. But if we can just be able to champion each other and support each other through with career development, through mentoring, you know, how many mentors do we have that are female? I, Lisa, will you believe, have had zero female mentors. In my life, I've had five or six phenomenal mentors and they've all been male. And it's about you know, where are these female mentors? I didn't have access to anybody. And I'm sure today I would have access, but when I was um, early on in my career, they just didn't exist. So we've got to be able to ensure that we're not excluding the female role model from the mentorship, the coaching, uh, the leadership piece. I think, um, I mean, you know, the, the usual stuff, the hiring processes, et cetera, they all need to be able to look carefully at um, reasons of family, uh, reasons of recruitment, looking at why women's pay is not equal still today. Um, there are lots of barriers which are both external and internal. I think cultural and societal expectations play a significant role. And I think we need to, and they change depending on the context, of course, in which you are. So it's very different here in the UAE and in this region for me as a female compared to what it was like in the United Kingdom as a female compared to what it's like in Pakistan or Saudi Arabia or India, et cetera, as a female. And I think these things, these places are sometimes entrenched with gender stereotypes, which genuinely undervalue women's abilities as leaders. And I think it's places like the UAE where you have the regulators and the rulers really empowering women by celebrating women and really endorsing um, women, leadership, women in leadership, but also women as women. And I think that needs to be ingrained in everything we do across society, not just a context or a country, but across the global society. And I think we need to be we, we need to we need to allow women to be masculine leadership role models as well as feminine uh, leadership role models. I think it's incredibly important. I think it does require proactive, um, intentional approach and not accidental approach. I think it's incredibly important that we have intent and it's not about positively discriminating, um, but it's about intentional um, intent to make sure that women are treated equally, but are also celebrated for who they are. So our children see um, our women as strong, uh, vibrant leaders um, in society, not just in the workplace, but at home as well. And, you know, I, I was really wanting um, to share with you that um, when I was younger, my mother used to say, I came from a culture that if you're first, um, if you're first born in your family wasn't a boy, you know, it was, um, it, it was not, it wasn't, it wasn't bad, but it, it, it was, it was great that you had a child and a healthy child. This was great. But if your second born uh, was not a boy and was a daughter after your first born, who was a daughter, um, you know, people sort of thought, oh, it's not a boy because, you know, the boy would continue the family name, et cetera, et cetera. That was a cultural background I came from. And I remember I used to say to my mother, because of course I was a second daughter born to my parents. Um, I would say to my mother, um, is, is it wrong to be born as a woman? I mean, nobody ever said anything to me, but, you know, but it was just something I knew and I was aware of as, as I was growing up. 
And my mother used to say to me, you know, you are so incredibly fortunate. You are so incredibly blessed to be born a woman. A woman, being born a woman means embodying strength and resilience, embodying empathy, in embodying um, unequivocal power to do anything you want to. And it's a privilege and embrace it, Saima. Embrace that you're a woman. You can do absolutely anything. Look at all the women around you. A woman is a source of pride, feel lucky that you carry this identity and always carry it with so much grace, so much determination, so much resilience that you're going to impact and change the world. That's what women do every day. She used to say to me, the greatest gift that God can give you is to be born a woman. And my mother, I mean, it gives me goosebumps now thinking of it. And she used to say, think about it. And as I said, my mother was from a very, um, uh, a very, uh, affluent um, and successful family. She was a teacher and she was a housewife um, and she was a mother. And she used to say to me, if you think about it, being a mother is the most is one of the most honorable of, of careers. If you think about it, you serve and not in the way serve, but you serve your children, you serve your family, you serve your country because you are creating amazing global citizens by being a mother, being a housewife, the world, you serve by being a mother. And she used to say truly, and now I genuinely believe this, by God, you know, being born a woman is truly magical. It's the best thing. And I think we just need to embrace this and make sure our children, our partners, our husbands, our parents, everybody understands just being a woman is an amazing thing. Embrace it and just go for it. Yeah. Wow. That I, I'm going to clip that piece and that's just going to be like a mini podcast on its own to empower women. Phenomenal. Your mother sound like she was an amazing human being because to, to come from a, a culture where there are little innuendos about the value placed on the lives of girls, but for her to really brush that aside and empower you in that way is phenomenal because she could have, she could have internalized that and sort of gone, oh, yeah, well, you know, we're just women. No, Instead, she flipped that on its head and said, no, to be born a woman is to be born powerful. Love, love, loved that. Loved that so much. Um, Thank you. I have one last question for you, um, which takes us back to education and just kind of looking at it with a global lens. What are you excited about as you look towards the future of education globally? So I think what I'm most excited about when I look at um, when I look at what's happening today and what the future holds for our children is this genuine, genuine landscape which allows every child because I don't think we've actually got it right for every child. A child with cerebral palsy, a child who is gifted and talented, a child who doesn't speak much English but is incredibly bright at performing arts. I look forward to a landscape, and you can see the. Uh, assessment and inspection regime moving towards this. I look through a landscape of education that really puts at the heart, and I think you've said this at the start of our conversation, that puts at the heart of education well-being and looks at well-being as not the end product and not as mental health and not as a meditation, and but looks at well-being in making sure that when children are being educated, they absolutely understand that it is not about the public examinations or the destinations, quite frankly, but it is about the living experience that you are enjoying today in this place as a grade six, as a grade two, as a grade 12 student, learning about education and learning about knowledge and most importantly, learning about perspective. Where, which perspective are you looking at this knowledge from? Because you know, you have one piece of knowledge and you've got three different perspectives from different countries and different contexts and different cultures and backgrounds. It looks different and it sounds different and it feels different. And I'm, I'm excited about the world moving to that place whereby children are so amazingly educated that they no longer feel conflict is the way and the solution to problems, but they act, actually understand that perspective is important to be able to work in harmony. We have one planet. Um, and I love that global warming and and COP28 in the UAE last year has has incredibly has endorsed an incredible sense of responsibility on all our children in particular about saving our planet and making sure we do the best for it. I love that well-being is something that people are openly talking about at the moment, and I'm, I hope they will continue to. Technology is great. I love technology, but I want technology to 
enhance the teaching and learning experience and never to replace it and and you know never to have those conversations about replacing teachers with robots or ai etc so i look forward to a landscape where education is actually for that purpose to educate children and not to train them for the world of work and not to train them so they end up in uh, the Russell Group or the Ivy League or wherever else they want to go, but to actually make them so confident as young adults uh, embarking upon a huge world and they can just be magical and experience those magic moments across across the globe, across every day. That is what I think the purpose of education is and that's what I'm looking forward to. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Dr. Saima. Thank you, Lisa. I really enjoyed it. I could talk and talk and talk, but we don't want that. I could listen and listen and listen, but I think we have really covered a multitude of fantastic topics on the podcast today. And I really do hope that it resonates with our listenership as much as it resonated with me. I do wish you all the success in your new role and your continued success at Gems World Academy that I hope to visit in the sometime near future. Um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. See you soon. God bless.